believe everyone wants to sh- get this on the road. <laughs> so on the road. So sounds good to me. All right, you're recording. Thank you. Okay, let me get my stuff ready. Oh, and welcome Stephanie, because I know Stephanie just came in. Um, no. Okay. Seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this September 21st, 2023 regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.32 p.m. Pursuant to uh, Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting can do so by Zoom or telephone. Uh, No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. This meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, At this time, I'm going to take a roll call attendance of committee members to make sure everyone can hear hear and be heard. And after that, I'm going to call um, on the three guests we have just to confirm that they can hear and be heard too. So we will start with the committee. Pat. Present. Shalini. Shalini may not be here. Uh, well, she's not here right now. We'll catch her if she shows up. Mandy is present. Uh, Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. And with that, let's go to our guests. We welcome Councillor Anna Devlin Gauthier. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, ECAC member, I guess. I don't know whether you're on the board, one of the titles, but Jesse Selman. Hello. Uh, we've got our sustainability director, Stephanie Ciccarello. Hello. And I think Rob just joined us. Rob. Yep, I'm here. Hello. Hi, Rob. And Shalini Balmilne, you've just joined us. So yes, I'm here. Okay. Present. Excellent. Um, with that, let's see. It is 4:33. So. Um, the first item of business will be a public hearing, but we can't, I can't start the script till 435. I don't believe the minutes of the September meeting were in the packet, but I could be wrong. Does anyone remember seeing them? They were not. They were not. I didn't, I didn't post them. I'm sorry. That's fine. I, I was like, sometimes I miss them myself. So we will postpone consideration of that. I'm just going to go through some of our other agenda items till we hit 435 here. So the minutes will be postponed till the next time. Um, I don't have any announcements. Um, So does anyone else have announcements? We'll skip next agenda preview till the end of the hearing, but any announcements from anyone so we can check that off the list. Oh, the announcements I have, we won't be, unless this hearing goes really quick, we're not going to be doing Nuisance House or AMAHT follow-up discussion items today. So we won't be doing uh, agenda items 3B or 4 today, unless for some reason this hearing is over by 5, and then we we'll, might actually just see what the committee wants to do at that point. But um, but yeah, Pam. So, um, I don't think the Nuisance bylaw was in the packet either. So I actually was looking for the most recent, and I said, Ah, it's not even in the packet. I think this is not yeah. um, a topic that we're going to need to get into in depth. Today. It was not, um, because I haven't modified it. I actually found, just to do that, and then we'll start the hearing, um, as part of an announcement, I found Boston, the city of Boston has a, prob- a nuisance property bylaw, um, and I will put it in the packet for next meeting, um, that I might be doing what we are have been struggling and talking about trying to do. So I think I, it, it's going to be in the packet. It might be worth everyone looking at that when I put it in the packet because it might save us a ton of time. Um, if that's, I think that in reading it, I think it's the way we would wanted to go. Um, so I will make sure it's in the packet for next week um, and all. So with that, but yeah, there was nothing in the packet for anything other than the stretch energy code today. So <laughs> you can tell my plan was not to do anything else. Um, with that, we will go to the public hearing. So it is 4.36 p.m. and I am 
uh, opening this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council, which has been advertised and notice has been posted on our town bulletin board and the hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendment to our general bylaw and its general bylaw section 3.48 stretch energy code to see if the town will vote to amend general bylaw 3.48 stretch energy code to adopt the specialized energy code codified by the entirety of 225 CMR 22 and 23, including appendices RC and CC with an effective date of July 1, 2024. So that hearing is open at 4.36 p.m. is when I started reading that. Um, the order of the hearing is um, we'll ask if there's any disclosures and then we will hear from Jesse and Stephanie and I, I'm not sure who all is doing the presentation, but Jesse, Jesse, Stephanie and Anna about the the request and the proposal. And then we'll take questions from the committee, questions from the public, uh, comments from the public, any responses or further questions from the committee. And then we'll see whether we're ready to close the hearing or continue the hearing at that point. Um, with that, are there any disclosures of committee members that need to be made? Seeing no disclosures, um, we will move on to Anna and Jesse and Stephanie. You are up for presentation and discussion. Well, presentation of what has been proposed. Thank you. Um, so I think really we don't have much of a presentation because our goal today was to get you the answers to the questions that were posed the last time that this was in front of CRC. So um, I just wanna confirm that everyone has had a chance to read those responses. Otherwise we can go through them uh, if folks would like, but if, if you've already read them, um, I don't know that we need to go through them one by one unless the, the chair thinks that would be helpful. Um, ultimately, just as a reminder, we are asking the CRC to recommend to the town council that we move forward in adopting the uh, specialized energy code, which is an, a more advanced building code designed to help us to reach our climate goals uh, and help improve building efficiency and, and lower, um, lower emission, greenhouse gas emiss emissions from buildings across Amherst. So that's the, that's the goal here. Um, we are part of the stretch code right now. We have um, adopted that, and this is a specialized code on top of it that is more stringent and would bring us further um, along that path to meeting those goals. We are, CRC asked some really great questions last time, and so we uh, worked really hard to get those answers to you um, and, and believe that we've answered those thoroughly. So happy to take any questions that folks have, but Jesse or Stephanie or uh, and I want to thank Rob for being here too. I know that was a question. Um, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Jesse, Stephanie, anything to add? See nothing. Oh, Stephanie. Um, no, I'm actually, I'm just really um, deferring to Jesse on this one who did a lion's share of the responses to questions. So yeah. I kind of want to defer to him, but I'm here if there are some questions that maybe need the town perspective. Thank the, you. the one thing I could say is we are not the only town having this conversation and there's, and so we included in that path, in those responses, links sort of I tried to high grade the links to, to get to what we thought were the, the best sort of top seven or so other resources. And so we weren't reinventing the wheel. There's a little, Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. We will move on to questions from our committee members. Pam. Thank you. Thanks. I was going to ask Rob, um, given that it's really going to be within his purview to keep an eye on things, maybe just some feedback on this. Hi, Rob. Um, just some feedback on the what you bumped into already with stretch code requirements and how um, I know you have said that the department can implement them, but I would really love some feedback on what it's gonna feel like. Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so we've, you know, this year we've been uh, implementing or, you know, applying and inspecting the new stretch code requirements and 
It's gone fairly smooth. Um, there have been some changes. Uh, you know, the residential contractors certainly um, get caught by surprise more than anyone else. You know that the, you know projects that don't have design teams associated with them. So we work our way through those. Um, all of our staff have been training uh, the new stretch code throughout the year. Uh, I, myself, I've attended most of the Mass Save webinars. Those are easy to you know to to listen to. They they're about they put them into about hour long uh, sessions, and you know I don't think there's been one. Uh, one of those that didn't touch on the specialized code or reference to it or comparison to it. Uh, so it's always interesting to hear the comments or read the comments, particularly from building officials, because, um, you know, they, they definitely, um, you know, have a lot of responsibility in learning these things and, and, you know, it kind of just gets given to them on a particular date. Uh, so uh, we're looking, you know, looking at this as a positive advancement in the code. Uh, looking forward to the trainings that will be offered specifically for specialized code. We started looking at it because we, uh, as you know, we're always looking at projects that take 12 months, 18 months to, to go from design into construction. So uh, design teams are, you know, starting to look at that and, and we are as well. So um, yeah, we're, you know, we're, I think as the questions and answers um, reflected, you know, we're supportive of this and, you know, in for what it takes to uh, be prepared. What are what are some things that your contractors are bumping into? And that, that as I understand this, most of the changes would not occur unless it's a residential over over four thousand square feet. But what are, so, what are the current guys bumping into? Yeah, so not not specifically with the specialized code, but with the new stretch code that is in effect that went into effect recently. Uh, some of the changes with residential code is um, uh, having a fully balanced HVAC system. So this requires an additional piece of equipment. There's more cost. There's more installation time. Uh, you know that was one thing that I've you know I have a lot of conversations about uh, EV charging in a home under you know a new new construction home the the latest code requires that you actually install the wire and the circuit uh the breaker so you, and and a receptacle you don't have to actually have the the charging unit installed but you have to have everything but the unit uh so that's you know that's something new uh so you know those are the types of conversations we run into the one that's been um probably the biggest you know point of concern recently has been um, what happens when you're putting on an addition and the level of testing and certification that has to happen. And there's this 1,000 square foot threshold now um, that, you know, didn't exist before. So that's, you know, those are things that, you know, just take getting used to. And, you know, as we become aware of changes like that, and we will with the specialized code, uh, we try to try to uh, capture those and, and talk with the builders and the, the developers and the owners when we're at the earliest stages of, planning their project. Um, what's helpful for us, what's helpful for everybody, is that there's always a third party involved here. So when, when there's new construction or substantial alteration or addition, there's going to be a HERS rater that's hired by the uh, owner or contractor. They do a lot of the programming, planning, and kind of, you know, putting all the pieces together. And then, you know, from that point on, our our goal is to pro is to make sure that the installation is correct and that nothing happens between uh, the various trades coming in and out of the project and you know drilling here or adding things and adjusting things and making sure everything stays according to that that plan. Can I clarify one thing for? Is that okay, Mandy? Sorry. Yes. Go Rob, ahead. you were talking about those the hiccups that have occurred. Those are with the existing code. And as an example, not something that would be, um, we don't necessarily know, you were just giving an example, but those are things that are with the current code, not attributed to the new that we want to opt into, right? Th those are all examples of the latest edition of, of the stretch code that we are, right. that we have in effect right now. Thank uh, you. That we just started working on this year. Okay. Thank you. And, yeah, thanks. Yeah. My, my last comment is, is that um, our, our new ADUs can go up to a thousand square feet. So I guess if they're at a thousand square feet or 999, maybe some of these uh, requirements do not apply. 
I would say if there are additions to homes at 999 and, you know, as you already suspect, I'm sure, is that, uh, you know, we we have cases where, you know, a, a proposal is a little bit over the thousand square feet and our discussion is, well, you know, this is what you can do if you're at 999. Um, and really the, the, the interesting part of the code, and I know it's being discussed by, you know, the, the, the writers and, you know, we might see amendments someday from what I understand, um, is that when you're doing, when you're putting that addition on your home, the testing that's required applies to the entire existing house. Yeah. And what happens when you cannot test? Now, this has nothing to do with specialized code again. This is about current code today that we're working through these issues is that, you know, first, how do you do that test? And what happens if you have to do something to your existing house to make it comply? And how much do you have to do? And it just simply, the code, the way it's written, just simply says, you know, you have to meet this standard. Uh, so there's been variance requests made. And, you know, I think ultimately we'll see some adjustment in the code uh, to deal with that uh, or have better guidance on how to deal with that. Thank you. So my, my question is, you know, I, I was... I will say, as I was looking at this, in some sense, I was pleasantly surprised that the difference between the specialized code and the stretch code isn't that much in terms of some stuff, because it it lessens my worry about increased costs and all of that. Um, but to me, one of the things, the biggest difference, and, and that most of the differences were with mixed fuel technology, not all electric technology. Um, and, and so, you know, pushing towards all electric technology is something we probably want to be doing anyway. Um, but the biggest difference seemed to be in those multifamily homes um, where you have to go to, it, it looked like in multifamily homes, if you adopt the specialized code, you would have to go to her zero, HERS zero, um, net zero, basically, whether you're all electric or mixed fuel. So I guess the first question is, am I understanding that correctly? Um, and if so, can someone describe to me what that, like, what, how do you do that? Like, how do you get from a HERS 42 or 45 to a HERS zero? Like, what are, that because that seemed like the biggest difference between the two codes. And so I, I would be curious to hear what what jumps you from 45 or 42 to zero. I'm gonna look to Jesse, maybe Rob on this one, but start with Jesse. I'm not sure that's right. I think I think you're seeing the a dwelling unit, a single dwelling unit it's over 4,000 square feet, that one of the, one of the specialized pathways is a HERS zero. And, and the way a HERS zero, what a HERS zero is, let's say you, the lower the number, the less energy the home consumes over the course of a year. So maybe a, um, well, so you can see that some of these are HERS 42, 45, those are some of the targets. You know, 35 would be a really exceptional home. And to cut, to go from 40 to zero would be using PV. And there's accommodations in there. So if the, there's a little note with the PV that says, if you can do PV, because many sites have trees and, 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 the, and this code is not in any way interested in cutting down a tree to get you PV can't tell you, cannot ask, the building code cannot ask you to cut down a tree. So it's, so it's if you have solar access, they, they use words like feasible for the solar access, but that's how you would get from 40 to zero is some amount of, of solar PV on site on the roof. I do not believe the multifamily is a HERS zero. It, it's a, there's a, a handful of different ways. And the main way they're looking at is the passive house yeah. certification and and I think it's an appropriate uh, use of that certification because it it's a building type that both has a tremendous benefit as far as indoor air quality and low utility bills, um, and also the the massing and and track record. There's a lot of passive house certified multifamily buildings in New England. It's it's being done over and over again, and not not at 
at a large price point. Um, so, so I don't know if that answers the question. That helps, yeah. Thank you. Um, Jennifer. Uh, thank you. So I, I did want to ask, because I was, I guess, confused about that. If you add a, a thousand square foot addition, then the original structure also has to come up to the same standard? I mean, e even with our, you know, the stretch code we have in place now, is that, was I understanding that correctly? <laughs> so I I'll take a pass okay. at it, but Rob, oh, no, Rob I didn't should also, okay. it's, <clears throat> it's um the hers rating a hers rating can only rate a dwelling unit and so if the addition i think rob correct me if i've got this wrong let's say it was just a 990 or let's say it was a adu addition and it had its own kitchen and bathroom and it was a its own unit then that could it, as i understand it that could get its own hers rating and it would have to hit whatever that target is. If the addition was just additional living space serving the same original dwelling unit, it would treat the whole thing as one dwelling unit, um, but it would be one rating for the entire building. So it may be that the, it doesn't mean you now have to definitely do a checklist of things on the existing building, it more it more means that when the entire building is modeled in the in the by the hers rater they sort of look at all the components the addition and the existing building that whole package deal has to hit the target and it could be that some work is needed on the existing building to get there it could be that additional work on the addition the addition could just perform that much better to carry the old building so it's not it's not simple, it, like you have to completely gut rent on the entire existing house just because you're going to like a thousand and one square feet. Rob, does that sound right to you? It, it does, that's correct. Um, each dwelling unit would have its own hers rating and, and scored independently. So I have a question, If now is there a difference moving from where we are now to the specialized code? in terms of what, what I guess it would be in terms of what's required if you were to put an addition onto your house of a thousand square feet? I think that all additions and renovations are, are under the stretch code. I don't think the specialized code really okay affects that. And that's, that's my understanding, but I say it at the risk that, and if it will, if there was a difference, it would be you know, the difference would be like a couple of hers yeah. rating points. Right. It's not a big, um, you're not moving to, it's not a big leap. It's not a big leap. No, it's it's a, from stretch to specialize is a much smaller leap than from okay. base to stretch. Is, is, to stretch. Yeah. And stretch is what we have. Okay. That's very We've helpful. Thank you. Of, yeah. I just have, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I just have her. one more question. Yeah. The hers rater. So I wasn't actually aware of that. I mean, just this is not um, just for my own curiosity. The home, the the property owner pays for that, and is that a costly? Our experience has been that on every every project I've used with a hers rater, the incentives that the hers rater finds for the homeowner, and the homeowner oftentimes pays them directly. Sometimes the general contractor pays them. The incentives have either equaled or far exceeded what the hers rater brings to the project. Um, you know, the all right now all electric houses are getting between 15 and $25,000 of incentive money and the hers raters typically are, you know, 10% of that. Okay, thank you. Well, that's it. Any other questions from the committee? Shalini. It looked like you were raising your hand, Shalini. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for the FAQs. That was really helpful. And um, and I just wanted to say that I we built our house in 2012 and it was all electric. And I can say it is very expensive at this point. So I'm hoping with doing this, actually, it might bring down the cost. But at this point, we are on a fully electric system. And we have geothermal, and it's pretty expensive. 
Um, so I just hope that when you say this is going to bring down the cost, maybe because there are more homes that are being put. Um, and so I'm not sure I understood how it brings down the cost, if you could explain that. And then how we increase the capacity to get so many more homes on electric. I think that's the right way to go. And I'm fully in support of all of this. But and that's one question. And the second is... I think the bigger homes, definitely, they should all be on board. I had to fight with my contractors, so I'm hoping this includes some sort of education for contractors to get on board and do this right. Um, I had to ditch my contractor and get a new one to put a geothermal because he wanted the old system. So, uh, so that's the first thing, to have some sort of education to bring the contractors, builders on board. The second thing, though, my bigger concern is how does it impact uh, lower income housing or um, rents when all of the costs are absorbed by renters, basically. So how do we make sure? So I, I, I think, I mean, I think that's exactly the right question. Um, the theoretically, and, and I think this has been proven in a number of examples, is the operating cost is, is lower. Um, you know, I, well, I, I don't know all of the details of your home. Um, <clears throat> the, the, and it, so let's put it this way. The houses use less energy. That's, or that is the goal. And so whatever the cost is, so their pay is, houses would need to pay for less energy. Um, as I understand it right now, gas is considered a lower cost fuel per million BTUs. It's not currently available for new construction in Amherst, which I think is maybe a separate conversation. So it, there isn't another, I'm not sure what the other option would be. Um, the, I think the goal is a, a more comfortable, better indoor air quality, lower operating costs, living space. That's, that's I think, the what has been seen in many of these projects. I think there are projects where um, the cost per million BTUs of electricity is higher. Therefore, the if the load of the house, the amount of electricity that the house consumes is high, it will cost more to operate. I, so I don't know for every example, but um, a large house with a lot of glazing um, and 2012 code insulation, that will use more electricity, which is, yes, expensive. Um, and all of these fuels, I think, will continue to go up in costs. Um, and so that's another thing is the idea that if it uses less, if the home requires less energy, it is more resilient to changes in energy costs. So if energy costs spike, that savings that was invested in the envelope and the windows and the mechanical systems that use less energy, period, it will cost less than a home that doesn't. I, mean, I, I, I just want to say that we just got a mass save and which I think everyone should do, get that free audit. And they said our in, in, um, insulation and everything was matching the top code right now in town. So we did do a very good job of all that. Um, I'm still not sure I'm, and, and how the cost is going to come down for the lower income housing with this. And when we say the operational cost, I don't have anything to compare with, so I don't know if it's come down or not. But um. I think the bigger problem for smaller homes, wouldn't it be at the time of construction itself to put in all these, put in the higher investment? Like, are there grants or something to support um, something like that? And the second thing that I'm thinking of is also were builders and all consulted and brought into this process. Because I mean, I'm just, for example, the one chain, this has not got to do with this, but when we make changes without hearing from different stakeholders, we run into problems later. 
And I heard that about the solar installations where the fire code, uh, where they changed it at the state level without consulting the solar industry and so forth about rooftop. And now I'm hearing a lot of complaints from the solar installers on rooftops that because of that change at the state level where the fire code people did not consult with, for right or wrong, I'm not saying that was right or wrong, but just the fact that that was done in isolation without speaking to the other stakeholders. Now the other stakeholders are facing the impact, which has ripple effects because many homes cannot afford to build rooftop solar because that fire code has not made it harder to, you know, has less space. And that's kind of my point. If you all have brought in builders and spoken to them, partly education, partly hearing what might be their concerns. So yeah, I, I was going to go to Anna and then Jesse, maybe, and then we'll go to Pat, see if we can get answers to those questions. Jesse, if it's okay, I have um, a, something on the first point. Shalini, there's a really great study from the Rocky Mountain Institute that talks about the cost over time and the greenhouse gas emissions over time with uh, all electric homes. And they compare it actually just to a mixed fuel home. Um, so you can just see the difference there in terms of upfront cost. It's very close to the same. Um, there's a drop for total annual operating costs. And again, this is for mixed, not, not strictly gas. Um, but then when you look at, again, we have to remember the why we're doing this. It's not, uh, yes, this the studies that I have read, and I don't, again, I don't know the details of your home and your experience, but the studies that we have read have shown that it is more cost effective to, to be switching these homes over. And the other thing on that is that the larger reason why this is important is the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from these buildings. And when you look at the, the greenhouse gas emissions from single family homes that are mixed use fuel versus those that are electric, there's a, a third over a 30 or just about a 30 ton CO2 drop over 15 years. So that's significant. And I think that we need to zoom out and remember that it's that while cost efficiency matters, and I believe is still supportive of this opt-in of the specialized code, it's not the only reason why. Um, and so we need to remember the other standards that we are, are holding our buildings to as well and, and why we do that. Um, and then the, Jesse, I guess I can, I can defer to you on the second point about consulting builders, but I just want to remind the committee that this is not a code that we wrote. This is from the state level. We are actually not allowed to change this code. We opt in to the code as written by the state. Um, and this was written by the state. I, uh, you know, I guess Rob might have a better idea on the ins and outs and on how state policy is, is written, but it is not written just by one party. It is very much a long arduous process that they go through. Um, maybe Rob, I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm thinking about other bureaucratic systems where, you know, I'm sure you have lots of critiques, but I do think that this is not something that is just drafted on a whim. This goes through a lot of research iteration and, and it's out there for good reason. Um, so just to be clear that while we have read the studies and have consulted with our planning department on their challenges here, we cannot change this code. We either opt in or do not. Um, and so that's the, I wanted to just clarify that we can't edit it based on feedback. Jesse, yeah, do you have any? Yeah, a couple of quick things. One is it, it, the cost per unit of energy varies from fuel source to fuel source. And mm -hmm. if nothing happens to a building and you simply go from gas to electric, then the operational costs can go up. And I think one of the things, one part of the intent of this code is to lower the overall energy consumption of the building so that when you do, so that when it is electrified, it's it's hitting an operational cost that's that's lower. That's the goal. So <clears throat> I think I kind of said that before. I'm just trying to say it again. Um, but yeah, the costs can go up. The cost of energy is high and volatile. Um, and overall, the better the building, the more protected someone is to that. Um, as far as outreach, I think our group and and the town, I think we can always do better. I think our my sort of mindset is we can always do better with outreach. We can always talk to more people, always hear more voices. I think we should never stop doing that. We've done a certain amount. We've had a number of meetings. This meeting, of course, is posted. We don't have a lot of public here. Um, this doesn't. This decision today doesn't enact the code. I think the ECAC is super excited about education. Stephanie has always supported our education efforts. We've already done, I think, four or five 
education workshops in our meetings, which have been moderately well attended about the technologies, about the code, working with MassSave, all kinds of different things. We've had actually some pretty good turnouts. It's been pretty, pretty good. Um, and this particular code was written by the DOER, the Department of Energy Resources. Um, it's one of, I think, seven books, all of which are this big, that, that Rob has on his desk, um, <laughs> that I have on my desk. And and I, I think an important point to make that Rob said is, this will need to evolve and get better and and work better for builders, work better for homeowners, work better for everyone. It, it's, it is a good first step, I think. But I think Rob's spot on. We need to give feedback. We need to make it better. One of the pieces of feedback I think is, is a good one is we like the specialized. We want, we want the levels to be just a tiny bit higher kind of say that to Boston and the people who are making these decisions. We, we want to be ambitious. And if they hear that, ideally, they will create a simpler, singular code that's not, you know, right now there's kind of four different versions of the energy code floating around. And ideally, we send the message, give us one and give us a good one. And that's kind of one of the sort of byproducts of this movement that I think would, would be useful. Thank you, Jesse. Before I go to you, Pat, um, I'm going to go to Stephanie. Thanks, Mandy Jo. Um, I just wanted to respond to Shalini's concern also about low income housing costs for the upfront construction, uh, especially right now, and especially in the state of Massachusetts, there are a lot of incentives and programs that support low income housing. So I, I do want to say that, you know, that in and of itself shouldn't be a barrier. Um, or um, maybe a, you know, a, um, a final decision maker on, you know, this is not good for low income, so we shouldn't do it. Um, I really think that there's lots of program and support. We're very fortunate that we live in Massachusetts. I feel like in terms of energy efficiency opportunities within the Commonwealth and support for low income, there's a lot of um, funding and especially with the federal funding that's coming down the pike, that's going to translate to more support for low income as well. So um, I just wanted to alleviate some of your concerns in that regard. Thank you, Stephanie. Pat. Uh, you're muted. Uh, you're muted. In my uh, naive or my first reading of this, it seemed in a very general way that all electric homes are cheaper to build uh, and there are incentives to be added there. It seems to me if you're reducing, um, I love the illustrations with all the wires and and uh, tanks of gas and oil and all that other stuff. It, it Even that image simplified. And it seems to me that this potentially supports uh, the uh, making the cost, whether it's a developer or individual homeowners, reduces the cost of uh, developing a duplex or townhouses, uh, which are smaller units usually but that's something that our society is moving towards. So I had an opposite read to uh, what Chalene was sharing, her, the concerns she was sharing. And I just wanted to bring those up. Thank you. Anna? Yeah, I wanted to add to what Stephanie said. She raised a really great point about the incentives available for low-income housing. There's also considerable incentives, avail incentives available for general um, single family housing, right? So there's a lot of things that came down through the Inflation Reduction Act. There's lots of mass save credits. There are a ton of different incentives um, for folks to pursue for, for that type of housing, as well as um, for low income housing, as, as Stephanie pointed out. Thanks. Thank you. My, my hand went down, so I'm going to call on myself because they've got this new thing where they just automatically lower your hand for some reason, and then I'll go Pam. Um, I was curious, I thought I heard Rob in some of the first times he spoke um, indicate that his department is supportive of adopting the specialized code. So I, I guess I wanted to just ask outright whether Rob's department and Stephanie, I, I assume Stephanie is, but I'd, I'd like to hear it from them without assumptions, 
are are you supportive? Would you support the adoption of the specialized code? Um, and I'm I'm guessing I'm I'm asking Rob for his department and Stephanie. We we are supportive of the adoption. Um, I think I'm not sure if this was mentioned yet, but the stretch code you know, automatically does have changes that occur July of 24. So, you know, adoption with an implementation or effective date of July of 24, to me is good, you know, so we're not making a change and then making another change. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to see that as kind of the way this is being lined up. So uh, yes, we are supportive of it. Thank you, Rob. Stephanie? Um, yes, absolutely in support of this. And I just wanted to um, actually say to Rob that we actually listen to you and that alignment is at your suggestion if we were moving this forward. So, you know, we do, we did take that into account. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Um, we had some, a lot of discussion as we were developing the rental bylaws that at the beginning we we're really pushing to um, include some incentive, or not 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 actually incentive, some requirements um, to rental units to do the audit to um, start to upgrade rental housing because it's such a big portion of our housing stock. Um, what Anna said, and I, other people have mentioned, are there any incentives? And I I think I've heard no. But are there any incentives for landowners to be able to start making some of these um, upgrades in their units? And that would that would really go a long way to um, to trying to help meet our goal of, of upgrading rental. Anna? I just want to clarify in question, do you mean directly from the town or do you mean in larger state, Large, federal, all, et cetera? The same, the same incentives that you rattled off. As I, I believe, I believe I'll look, I'll look to Stephanie and Jesse on this and, and maybe Rob as well. Sorry, I keep just grouping y'all in there. Uh, I believe that the, there are incentives again, through things like the inflation reduction act that aren't necessarily um, divvied out based on whether you're putting it in your own home or into, in a home that you rent out. Um, I believe that those, those incentives for things like heat pumps, like heat pump rebates and, and such would still be available. Um, Stephanie, Jesse, or Rob, do you have any insights on this that you'd like to share? All I was going to say is that, you know, very often the federal incentives are actually implemented through the state. So I'm not sure if that gets to what you were asking. Um, I'm not sure I 100% understood your question, Pam. Sorry, um, but but just I mean, there is if you're asking if it's you know is there funding supportive beyond just the state incentives? Very often, what the state incentives are are actually federal incentives. So my quite my question was, Anna mentioned that there are lots of lots of programs, grants, incentives for single family homes. The question is, can landowners apply homeowner? Landlords, I'll just say, rental unit owners also be applying for these and getting some of these incentive dollars that uh, homeowners tend to be able to do. It's a great question. I know MassSave has uh, a target audience directly to renters, which is kind of cool, and that's somewhat recent for them. Don't actually know a lot about it. Um, I believe these and these incentive programs tend to change often as the funding streams change i think we're kind of at the precipice of quite a bit of new programs and i think and this is another one where i would have to look again and obviously this is all separate from the specialized code conversation this is just incentives for existing multifamily buildings i think um i believe any incentive, I think those, I think those incentives do exist. Um, I think in some ways there cannot be enough incentives for existing multifamily buildings. It is an incredibly important um, type of building typology and population to improve that housing stock. It's all over the news. We don't have enough of it and it's not good enough. There's billions of dollars of deferred maintenance in the existing low income housing in our state right now. And so 
it would it would follow that incentive money would go to those buildings. I think I'm, maybe I'm making a plug for it as much as answering the question. It's critically important, though. Well, Jesse, I would point to the PACE program. You know, the PACE program, um, and at, at the moment, off the top of my head, I won't even begin to sort of say, um, encapsulate what that is, but maybe Jesse can speak to that. But um, that's an opportunity, certainly, for multi unit. Um, dwellings and particularly low income housing. So there's real, I think there's a real incentive, especially in Massachusetts right now to really target low income housing and renters, rental units. So I do think there are some incentives existing for landlords. Um, I couldn't tell you specifically what they are, but PACE is certainly one of them. And Jesse, if you want to give a plug for PACE, please. Yeah, yeah. so PACE, and this is one that's actually handled by a different member of our, the ECAC team. Um, but it, I think it's a it's a program for commercial building stock, which would include multi-unit um, rental housing, um, where it, it's it's great incentives where they're they're really um, adding sustainability upgrades, a lot of mechanical and envelope upgrades to projects that otherwise uh, weren't going to do them. So it's a huge funding source. It's, it's P A C E all caps pace. I think it's worth googling. Our, the ECAC, that's actually one of our next education programs that we're going to be putting on, um, where I will actually be learning more about it at that time as well. So I would say keep an eye out for that one. Do we're, the Department of Energy um, uh, Resources also has a pretty incredible resource list of all the incentives available, Pam, and I was just looking at it to see if they specified, and some of them do specify that they're available for rentals, um, for rental units, essentially. Um, so if you, I, I, I'm not going to give you the long, long, long thing, but if you Google, uh, it's it's the title of it is Massachusetts Energy Rebates and Incentives, um, and they list them all out, including for commercial businesses there as well, in addition to the PACE program that might be worth worth checking out. And my final my final question is, um, if we adopt the um, specialized code, does that does that uh, enable us to be considered for additional dollars? Is is there any kind of bonus to the town for doing that? Significant reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. It would it would also by default qualify I think qualify projects for more incentive money. A lot of these incentive programs are based on your HERS score. So sometimes, it, so it's going to, it would, and again, this is actually, it's actually a small part of the puzzle for our town. There's, I think, Rob, eight to 12 new houses a year, maybe in Amherst. Um, not a, not a huge um, piece of the puzzle, but the better the building, the more the incentives typically. Um... I don't see any other hands right now. This is a public hearing, so I'm going to, the committee will have a chance after we hear from the public to ask more questions. Um, but right now I'm going to move to the public uh, question side. So if any members in our audience have any questions for the committee, or the presenters, please raise your hand at this time. We will have an opportunity for comments to be made after the questions are done. Seeing no hands for questions, if anyone in the audience, uh, in the public would like to make a comment on the current hearing on uh, the proposal to adopt the specialized code, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands for that either. So we will move back to committee questions. And I have one more. Um, Pam raised a a point, and I, I guess I, I want to ask sort of a follow up. You know, in reading the materials, it indicated that all the green com communities have adopted the stretch code. My guess is that you can't be a green community unless you've adopted the stretch code, and that being a green community 
opens up sort of extra points or or opportunities for grant programs from the state. And I think this is what Pam was getting at. So I, I, I wanna further expand on her question of, do you see in the future um, that green communities requiring adoption of the specialized code or other grant programs, you know, saying, well, if you haven't adopted the specialized code or if you have adopted the specialized code, you get priority over towns that have only adopted, say, the stretch code, something like that. I don't know how the green communities ones work, but I think that's where Pam was going with it. Stephanie and then Jesse. So I'm actually have been on the green communities advisory committee and there has no been no discussion, at least in the more recent, we haven't had a meeting for a while, but in the more recent meeting that did not come up. Um, as you correctly noted, you have to become a stretch code community, um, but it does not require you to adopt the specialized code. Um, and I it, I don't necessarily have a crystal ball to know in the future if they would require that. Um, but I would say that there's likely to be some more advantages, I think, if you have, you know, in future funding, I would expect that there, that would be an advantage. Uh, it certainly would not hurt us. Thank you, Jesse. I think it's a, this is all conjecture, but, and maybe a little different than what Stephanie's saying is, but I would just like to publicly make another push that we all, everyone in the state has one code and it's a great code. And, and having multiple layers and conditional, you know, give all the towns funding, give all the towns a good energy code that's easy to follow. That's that's kind of, the, that's beyond the scope of this meeting, but my conjecture, that's, that, that's the next step. Thank you, Pam. Could somebody um, point us specifically to a comparison of what the stretch code upgrade that occurs next July, 2024, how do we compare the upgrading stretch code with a specialized code that we might vote in now that would also go into effect in July, 2024? Is there a nice little table, little diagram specifically for the upgraded stretch code, not today's stretch code? Is the charts that were in the FAQ, is that for the updated stretch code? I think it is. Um, I think it is. I, let me, I, if, it, if that is for the updated stretch code, then that is the best summary there is. If that's not, if that's the current stretch code that <laughs> you can see how dumb this is, um, then that chart might not exist right now. Um, but I could look, I, I, I could certainly look into what is the current best comparison chart. This, I put that in thinking it was the most current best comparison chart. Um, I think what you're asking for is confirm it's referencing stretch code July 1st, 2024. Jennifer. Yeah, so I guess I must have misunderstood this. I thought the uh, specialized code that we might vote to opt into just meant that we got to that point sooner, but I thought there was a point at which, but that's not true, that the specialized would become what, what all of the stretch codes would. No, the specialized code is ahead to. of it and, and likely will stay ahead of it, is my okay. understanding, right, Jesse and Stephanie? That's what we understand is that like this, this, this I think in an ideal world, the specialized code is getting pushed out there and then everyone catches up. And then in an even more ideal world, like each time, the, the building code updates it. Right now, Massachusetts, Massachusetts is in the ninth edition of the building code. And pretty At some point, we're gonna go into the 10th edition. It'd be best for Rob I, and his team and all the other building departments, I think if, if the energy code just updated at the same time, that um, this is this is Massachusetts's workaround right now because the, because the base energy code is not considered ambitious enough or, um, 
getting to our climate goals. So that's what the stretch code is doing. So for the time being, I believe the stretch code will lag slightly behind the specialized code. I think it catches up a little in July. It gets closer. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe the document that was one of the documents in your packet does outline some of the differences. But what's challenging, Jennifer, is, or whoever asked this question initially, um, is that typically the comparisons are the July 2023 stretch code versus the old one, and it doesn't bring in the specialized. So you kind of have to do that, do that, putting them next to each other. Um, but I believe that one of the documents, I'm trying to figure out the title of it now, that's uh, the FAQs from the Department of Energy um, does go through the differences, at least in the, the new updates. And then it talks about the um, the stretch code as well. So you, if you can kind of do the back and forth and uh, between those, then there's the chart. Thank you. Shalini. So I was looking at the question about the impact of this on the DPW and other town buildings, and it's at see the attached report. I, I'm sorry if I missed it, but I'm not seeing. So can someone just summarize what would be the impact? And where is that report? So it's the, I, this is the, I think it's the cost and energy efficiency analysis study that's linked. Um, and what that report does is it goes through a number of different building types small office, large office, office lab, elementary school, high school, multifamily uh -huh. tower, four story, all et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It goes through all of these. It doesn't have, you know, I don't, let's see, I don't know if it has a specific. Um, sure, for DP, because we don't have the cost for a DPW yet, but. Right. Um, but which one is it? I'm not still seeing it. In... I think it just referencing the second to last page of that document. Where it is says helpful, point? helpful links. Uh huh. And I couldn't click onto them somehow. Oh. I've downloaded. Well, yeah. That could be. I wonder if those links got dropped in. It, it emailing from I couldn't me, link uh, either uh, to you. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I did a search and I can put what I think two of those, some of those that were linked to were already in the packet, I believe. And I think I found two of the other ones. But if if Jesse sends me, so I'm not guessing at which ones they were, I, I will make sure they get into a packet. Can I? Yeah, I... Oh, sorry. That's a technical something. I apologize for that. That's okay. So which one would it be even out of these links where we can see the comparison for the different buildings, what the impact might be? The, the first one, uh, cost and energy efficiency, and the, the DOER, okay. where it says helpful link. So I'm going to uh -huh. send that to... Can I ask a clarifying question, though, um, about DPW specifically um, and fire station? Those buildings would be caught under the net zero bylaw already because they're over a million dollars, correct? And so they'd already be pretty much in this zone. Um, so there wouldn't necessarily be, I, I don't know the exact changes, but because projects over a million, I think that's the threshold, right? For net zero. Um, but all town buildings, right? Have to be net It's zero. all municipal. Yeah, all municipal buildings yeah. over a million um, in, in building would be under net zero. And so net zero mm -hmm. is is getting pretty much at the same it's it's dovetails in with the the specialized code um nicely if that helps a little bit as well i'm going to interrupt for a second my dog just got back from the vet and i need to uh, find out what i need to, to keep her healthy okay thank you pat we'll note you're stepping away okay. mandy joe I, I sent you those links again hopefully they will be okay. live. I, I will make sure I download them and get them into the packet for everyone um, so that they're there. But but Anna, I think, made a good point that the were required for those DPW buildings to be net zero anyway. Um, and, and they would have to meet the base, the stretch code. Anyway, like, yeah. They, they, were, they will probably exceed what's required by the specialized code. Um, so minimal additional impact is the, the short answer to the to the actual question. Minimal, if any, I would say. Any other questions from the committee? 
without any questions, it's up to us to decide whether we're ready to close the public hearing or not. We generally don't discuss recommendations until the public hearing is closed. Um, are we feeling like we can close the public hearing? Pam. Looks like we could close the public hearing because we had no input as part of the public conversation, sadly. Um, so I would I would make a motion that we close the public hearing. Uh, I would second. Me. And hopefully there was a whole lot more discussion at at um, ECAC. Okay, and so in other venues. Yep. So we have a motion by Pam to close the public hearing. And Jennifer, you were the second, right? Yeah, Jennifer. I just want to make sure I had the notes right. Um, is there any discussion on closing the public hearing? Seeing none, we will vote. Um, Shalini. Yes. Uh, Mandy is an I. Pam. Yes. And Jennifer. Yes. And Pat stepped away from the meeting for a bit, so she is absent on this vote. So that vote is 4-0 with Pat absent um, on closing the public hearing. So the public hearing is closed. It is 532. Um, that completes item two of our agenda. Item 3A is the discussion and vote on a recommendation on the proposed adoption of the Specialized Energy Code, which is a actually bylaw language. Um, is this committee feeling like we might be able to complete that discussion today? I can put the proposed language up on the screen. It's in the packet. Um, it's from the the state basically. And while it looks like a repeal and replace, it would not actually be voted as a repeal and replace um, because we would want to keep the stretch energy code in place until the specialized goes in if we would adopt the specialized. So we would not want to actually repeal the bylaw and replace. We just want to essentially delete and insert. <laughs> it's kind of strange, um, but but the motion, there's a draft motion in there too that sort of makes clear that until, the, until July 1, 2024, if this is the recommendation that the stretch energy code would remain the um, adopted code. Um, conversation on that. I know people want to get out, but it sounds like we might be ready to have that discussion and potential make a potential recommendation today. So thoughts on Mandy. Yeah. So on the on the second page of the of the sample town motion town council motion it is that the town rescind existing oh structure. yeah that is and and i think that i i think i forgot to fix that i will say that right now let me i don't have my packet up um yeah and so i think i think that in thinking about it later, good good catch, Pam, and thinking about it after this, I was like, wait, if we rescind and replace, we're we might be rescinding the application of the stretch energy code. Um, and we don't want to do that. So I think we just I think the language is move that the town revise. Hang on, let me. So I think we would want this to be
I think it would be revised general bylaw 3.48 stretch energy code to adopt the specialized energy code. Well, actually to adopt the specialized energy code would show up at a different spot. Um, I think this is the sample council motion. Revised general bylaw 3.48 as shown on whatever pages of the motion sheet. Um, for the purpose of adopting the specialized energy code and regulating the design and construction of buildings for the effective use, and then everything else I think it is, um, with an effective date of July 1, 2024, current bylaw shall remain in effect until it is replaced with the specialized energy code, something like that. I just, we, KP law had recommended that we be clear in whatever motion we do, that the stretch energy code remains in place until the specialized energy code is in there. So we might have to finagle, Athena might have eventually some idea of fixing better wording of the language. Um, I guess it could be the current, the stretch energy, I guess it doesn't have to be this. The stretch energy code shall remain in effect until it is replaced with the specialized energy code, something like that. Um, but that that's a modification of the DOER recommended town meeting motion. Since we're not town meeting, I had to figure it out. They didn't recommend a town council motion. So <laughs> I had to do it, but the proposal is essentially delete what's there and rename it specialized instead of stretch and take the language from, from the DOER recommendation, which is slightly longer because it defines stuff. Thoughts on recommendations for making this bylaw change because ultimately that's what we would be voting a recommendation on whether to recommend the council do this so our motion would be to recommend the town council law jennifer yeah i guess i just <laughs> I, this isn't very profound, but um, we're kind of collectively uh, in the situation. Part of why we're in the situation we're in with our climate and environment is that it was, you know, always too expensive to make the changes we needed to make. So I think, in the, you know, I, I would say we need, there, there may be some expenses, but um, it's the right thing to do. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, support it. Thank you. Any other? I'm getting this weird like window thing. <laughs> um, I I will say I I think I I'm with Jennifer. the The differences seem min in some sense minimal minimal, but in another sense highly effective and necessary. So it's not like we're drop we're jumping from a hers of a hundred to a hers zero, I would say, you know, like like it's that next step from where we are and and it seems like we should be doing that. So I I would it when we get to a motion, I, I would vote in favor of a recommendation when we get there. Pam. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree and I think it's an important thing to do. I I was sort of hoping to get that last piece of information, which is um, how does the specialized code compare to the the incoming already in progress, already anticipated 2024 stretch code? Um, again, if it's if it's quite similar to what we are all already going to be dealing with, because we automatically up upgrade as the as the code does, then um, I'm more comfortable with recommending it at this point. You know, we have between now and the council meeting to do the rest of the homework. Mm 
Jennifer. Yeah, I, I also feel more comfortable that uh, Rob Morrow seems comfortable with it. That that was important to me to hear. Pat? I think this is a critical thing for us to do, and I'm uh, in support of it. In 2011, we had an energy retrofit on our house. We went from oil, heat, and um, every kind of very drafty home to a, a pretty tight home with one heat pump and a very, very tiny wood stove that we use sometimes in the winter, um, using less than half a quart of wood to heat because we rely on the heat pump. So the, these transition, my house was over 100 years old then. So I feel like these are actually very simple. And what I see is the costs of maintaining a home or paying rent if you're a renter will less be reduced. The cost of construction potentially can be reduced dramatically. And I think that we need to step right up to this. Any other hands on discussion? Seeing none, um, I think we can go with a simple motion unless you want me to read the whole thing. I'll read the whole thing. Um, I'll move to recommend that the town council Yeah, that the town council vote to revise general bylaw 3.48 stretch energy code for the purposes um as as presented. This is the as presented here. Um for the purpose of adopting the specialized energy code and regulating the design and construction of buildings with an effective date of July 1, 2024, the stretch energy code would remain in effect until it is replaced with the specialized energy code. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Um, is there further conversation? Seeing no hands, we will vote. Um, we start with Pat. Aye. Mandy is an I. Pam. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. And Shalini. Yes. That is a unanimous recommend recommendation in favor of adopting the specialized energy code. The next steps on this um, will be that sometime today or tomorrow, I will forward this formally, the revised bylaw or the proposed bylaw to Pat as chair of GOL for its consideration of whether that revision is clear, consistent, and actionable. Um, and, and then when GOL finishes, it would come to the council for a first reading and a second reading. I can't guess when that might be, but probably sometime in October or November. Um, so any other questions on that action item and the next steps for this? referral and specialized code. Pat. I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank Jesse uh, and Anna. And I want to give a particular shout out or thank you to Stephanie and Rob Mara, our building inspector. You work hard for us and you have the respect of the town council and many, many, many members of our community. And I just want you to carry that with you all the time, please. Thank you, Pat. Thank you to ECAC committee yeah. and our awesome and, staff. Second, and, everything that Pat said. And I want to thank all of you. Maybe I, I'm headed over to the block party after this. Um, maybe I'll bump into some of you, but also just um, if anything else comes up, you have questions or concerns, send it to the ECAC through Stephanie or Anna, and we will try to help make sense of it all. Thank you, Jesse. Anna. Yeah, I just wanted to to publicly do the same thank yous that everyone else has, has been doing. Um, this has been, I've learned so much from Jesse and Stephanie and, and Rob through this process. So I want to thank them for um, helping to educate us all as we as we go. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I know it's a little late, but I, I think I explained this before, but not during this meeting. Anna is here because she is liaison, the council liaison to ECAC. I am not the council liaison to ECAC. Oh, I thought you were I'm here because I'm just sponsoring this. Oh, you're sponsoring it. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought you were sponsoring it because you were the council liaison. <laughs> no, uh, Alicia, Alicia is the council liaison to ECAC. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I, you're I, here I, because I you're the one sponsor. Year. Yeah, <laughs> thank you though. Um, with that, um, yeah, I, everyone said the thank yous to Rob and Stephanie and Jesse and Anna. Um, we will be moving on. Jesse, I think you might see many of us. We have one more thing basically to do before we can adjourn our meeting, um, but everyone else is free to go. We're going to be holding general public comment next, um, but then right after that is done, we will probably be adjourning our meeting. So thank you, Rob, Stephanie, Anna, and Jesse for joining us today. Um, with that- thank you all. I will be moving on to item five on our agenda, general public comment. Public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC will be accepted at this time. Anyone in the audience is welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. And now that There's I have nobody that, there. I am going to also say there are now no one attending this meeting. The one person we had has left. Um, so with that, I am now closing general public comment. Um, um, we did announcements. The next agenda will be, I'm going to be really quick on this. I mentioned a little bit about the Boston thing. I will get that in. I'm thinking of potentially drafting a, an updated nuisance based on the Boston one, but um, I don't want to take time today to pull up Boston to see if people are there. So we'll see, but um because everyone's trying to get out to the block party. So um, next agenda will have nuisance on it, but the first thing on it will be rental registration. Andy touched on it a little bit. Finance has sent us back some guidelines. Um, and basically in my attendance at those meetings, they've sent us the guidelines and I think we're back on with a recommendation for fees for the actual schedule based on their guidelines. Um, so they also have some suggestions for revisions to the bylaw and the regulations. So, so I will come in with that. I will put that memo in the packet. Um, I'll come in with some draft revisions that were recommended by, by Rob actually during discussions and by some of the finance committee members. So we'll deal with that one first and then we'll go to nuisance. And then um, after nuisance, if there are time, we will return back to some of that AMAHT discussions. That's the plan for the next agenda. Anything else, Pam? Um, would you send along the Boston thing before you before you adjust the nuisance bylaw itself? Yes. Could you send the Boston thing to all of us? I, I will. I, I haven't decided. I, I will send it along, and I probably, because we're not going to take the time today to at least throw up Boston and see what people think, I probably won't take the time to do anything. Um, but it's, it means I probably won't adjust the current draft of our nuisance either based on conversations. I'm trying to be a little more efficient and save time. Um, but yeah, I, I will make sure Boston is in there. I've been looking for some others, but Boston, like I said, came up from seeing Boston's rental registration that referred to their nuisance property. So um, I'll put it in there. Any items not anticipated? Are we not meeting again till the 12th of October? We are meeting the 5th, I believe. I think we're the 5th and the... Okay, now I'm confused. When is, when is the League of Women Voters? Forum? It is the 5th. Um, and we are meeting the 5th. So that meeting will be a slightly shortened meeting so that everyone can get to the League. We will start at 4. Oh, that's right. They changed it because of TSO, not us. Yes, Got it. they changed TSO. it because of TSO that meets at 7. And I told them that ours did not technically conflict. So so you would not be conflicting with a CRC meeting if they held it at seven. We will aim to end our meeting before 6.30 that day. Um, so um, we're not gonna, we're definitely not gonna go late. And I will, like I said, we probably won't get to AMHT. We might only get to rental registration depending on how long that takes and what we wanna do. But um, we will end that meeting less than two hours in. <laughs> um, as we all juggle everything. But no, the fifth is our next meeting. Um, and then we are on the five plus uh, the 19th, I believe, um, first and third. Anything else? Seeing none, enjoy the block party. We're adjourning at 5.51 p.m. See you all there. Bye. <laughs>